approximately 11 a.m. on a Saturday morning at a conference for experimental biology last April, we sent a hopeful email on a whim. We were emailing Dr. Peter Agre, a Nobel laureate in chemistry, about the research poster we had just spent nine months pulling together. We were asking if he could maybe, possibly, stop by and talk to us, and we anxiously paced around waiting for his response. Finally, Dr. Agre emailed us back. He called our research topic fairly unusual, which we took as a compliment, <laughs> and gave us his best wishes for the remainder of the conference. On the surface, an email may seem insignificant. However, to us, this email represented our breakthrough into the scientific community. Although he would not be attending the conference at the same time as us, we had made a personal connection. Scientific researchers were no longer just an abstract idea wrapped in a lab coat. One year prior to this, we were sitting together in our biology classroom, being invited to join an obscure science club by our advisor, Mr. Lane. And he made it sound exciting enough that the four of us joined not knowing what we were getting ourselves into. And boy, what did we get ourselves into? It took us a long time to figure out how exactly we were going to format our research into a poster. I'm sure that it won't come as a surprise for me to say that we didn't become pros overnight. No, in order to gain a deeper understanding of our topic, we had to define every other word in the scientific papers that we read and held long discussions over single sentences in those same papers. It made us uncomfortable at first, the not knowing, but over time, we got a lot more familiar with our topic as our deadline approached. We completed our project just in time and headed off to Orlando for the Experimental Biology Conference. EB is a huge meeting where life scientists and biomedical researchers meet to network and share cutting edge research. A conference this size was intimidating to high schoolers like ourselves. During the presentation of our research, we talked to scientists, undergrad and graduate students, professors and high school biology teachers, and actually found it a lot easier to convey our topic than we had originally thought. We left that conference feeling pretty good about what we had accomplished, but the real light bulb moment didn't come until later when we got back home. Everyone wanted to hear about our topic, the school board, community organizations like this one, friends, family members, all very different groups than those we had presented to at EB. It was much harder than we thought it would be to present to non-scientists. There was a barrier between the complex ideas in our research and non-scientists without background knowledge in microbiology. We realized that we had to completely change the way that we presented to these groups of people. If we as high school students were able to break through this barrier, we were confident that anyone else could too. Let's use last year's poster as an example. If you sat out in the lobby earlier, it might have seemed complex and intimidating, but when we break it down, it's actually quite simple. First, we need to explain the protein we studied, aquaporin. All aquaporin does is allow water to flow in and out of cells. One aquaporin is called a monomer, pictured on the left. In the cell, four of these monomers join together into a tetramer, pictured on the right. Now, this may look like a convoluted mess of squiggles, and don't get me wrong, proteins are extremely complex, but you don't have to understand every little detail to understand the function. Basically, there's a channel in each monomer that allows water to flow through, and that's it. Now, bear with me while we take a small detour. This is a hagfish, a species of small marine vertebrate that hasn't changed much since it evolved millions of years ago. That's because this creepy little eel looking thing has a defense mechanism effective enough to fend off sharks. When a hagfish is threatened, it releases a defensive slime from its gland that looks like this. This slime expands rapidly, clogging the gills of sharks and suffocating them. Believe it or not, it also has medical applications. It's made up of fiber skeins that are 100 times thinner and 10 times stronger than nylon, and it could be used as a potential, potential bandage to clog major wounds and slow bleeding much more effectively than current methods. So what does this have to do with aquaporin? Well, the water that fills up the slime gets in through aquaporin. I'm going to show you another scary science image, but I promise it's the last one. This is a representation of what the hagfish releases, called a mucin vesicle. Inside this vesicle are the fiber skeins that make up the slime, the blue squiggly lines, which are released when the vesicle fills with water and bursts. How this happens is calcium in the seawater opens channels in the membrane, the purple lines in the photo, like gates. These gates allow random particles in seawater, pictured here as triangles, 
to flow into the cell, changing the nature of the cell to favor water. This is where aquaporin comes in. Aquaporin is the blue lines in the photo. And as you know, it's just a water channel. Now that the cell favors water, water begins to flow through the aquaporin at a rate of three billion water molecules per second, filling the vesicle with water until it explodes, releasing the slime. See, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> it really wasn't. In less than two minutes, we went from knowing almost nothing about aquaporin or hagfish to understanding the workings and potential medical applications of a hagfish's slime mechanism. And this topic is complex, far more than most mainstream science concepts are. If we can handle this, then it's much less intimidating to tackle concepts that are much more applicable to our lives. So, you may be thinking, that's pretty cool and all, but why should I care? Scientific advances affect all of us, but are often lost in transit between scientists and non-scientists. News reporters often politicize scientific debates, watering them down from true research worthy of investigation and presenting them to the public as just another article. It's important that we begin to chase our own conclusions instead of just skimming over the biased headlines of big name news reports. Take for example insulin and the current controversy over its rising prices. For type one diabetics especially, this drug is a difference between life and death. But while the media focuses on prices alone, researchers have been developing a new type of insulin derived from cone snails that could be administered at a much lower cost. But this drug won't have the chance to save lives until it is developed, put on the market, and even then, without proper media attention, it may never reach the people who need it the most. Another example of this is the global climate crisis that we're currently experiencing. Climate change is a topic that has long been debated and as a result has become extremely difficult to keep track of. Changes in our climate, like the atmospheric carbon dioxide levels reaching an all-time high and the ocean acidity rising 30% since the Industrial Revolution, have become lost within political debates. Looking past the headlines, one can see that the science tells a much more objective story. And it is just as important to keep up with science when it goes wrong. Ethical dilemmas arise as we continue to push the boundaries of our knowledge. Last year, Chinese scientists used CRISPR, a gene editing tool to create genetically modified babies. The controversial move highlights the ethical can of worms that can be opened when we use these powerful new tools. And sweeping changes like this happen quickly and have the potential to send our natural world into distress. That's why it's important to keep up with the scientific community. And the truth is, your money may be going to experiments you don't ethically support. Taxes play a big part here, not in scientific research, but in how they tie together scientists and non-scientists. Every person who is employed in the US pays some form of taxes. Public researchers, especially those working for government or universities, spend much of their time writing grants to fund their research. This means that American taxpayers like you guys are funding most of the research being conducted in the public sector. And if the American worker is paying for that research, then that worker has a right, and dare I say, an obligation to at the very least be aware of what topics are being investigated. Caring about science is only half the battle. If you care about something and don't do anything to change it, what good will that do anyone? Action must be taken to break down the barrier around the scientific community in order to make any kind of change. Scientists are often connotated with a variety of images, from a person dressed all in white holding a magnifying glass to a mad scientist with singed hair and latex gloves. <laughs> However, in reality, scientists, apart from getting excited about strange things like hagfish, are just regular people who are easy to reach out to and collaborate with. In most scientific articles, the author's name and contact information is listed. This is partly to claim ownership for their work, but also because they want people to reach out, ask questions, and start a discussion. Now, some may argue that it's too hard to keep up with scientific advancements because they can't understand the jargon. However, scientific journalists make it easy to stay updated with the latest information. The main part of their job is to phrase complex ideas into a way that the average person can understand. Most people follow news outlets like CNN or BuzzFeed, but in addition to keeping up with sports and politics, we need to make an effort to keep up with scientific advancements as well. Once we do that, we can talk about it with friends and family, whether we agree with what we hear and read or not. Just the simple act of discussion 
can open our eyes to new ideas and help us form new opinions. The science community is not an ivory tower, so we should all stop treating it as such and get involved. Now this doesn't mean that you have to go out and email a Nobel laureate to become involved with the scientific community. We were grateful to receive an email from Dr. Agre, and for us, it was our light bulb moment. But we want this to be your light bulb moment, to go forth and have confidence in your ability to engage with science and to form opinions on the issues that matter most to you. Because now more than ever, we need to generate discussion. This may mean stepping outside of our comfort zones and rethinking the way that we approach science, not only through academic angles, but also through social, political, and financial angles. We came to you as a team today, not just to share our story, but also to actively demonstrate the way in which we need to approach science. It must be together, and it must be in a way that has never been done before. This is how progress will be created, and we hope that you will take part in it with us. Thank you.